During World War II, the Germans built many planes, some we're familiar with like the BF-109. They only built around 34,000 of them, it's one of the most built planes of all time. The Germans also built rarer planes like the Blomenvoss BV-138, of which they built around 300 of. This video is going to be focusing on German prototypes which if you pardon the pun, didn't take off, either due to other choices in design direction or lack of resources to build more planes. These are my top 5 weird German prototypes that actually flew. For this list there are only two rules, the plane had to exist and that it had to have completed a flight. So that means no paper blueprint planes or no prefabricated models or mockups. Without further ado, let's get on with the list. Number 5, the Blomenvoss BV-40. This little glider doesn't look too aggressive. It doesn't look out of place as a recreational glider, perhaps something that one would take out on the weekend on a nice warm summer's day. What separates the BV-40 from a standard glider is a set of twin 30mm autocannons, each one equipped with 35 rounds, bringing the BV-40's maximum ammunition up to 70 rounds. I can't emphasise how odd it is to have guns on a glider. The BV-40 is the only glider fighter ever made in history. This is further emphasised by the fact that the guns are twin 30mm cannons. Look at this comparison between a 30mm shell and a Browning 50 cal round. The reason that the BV-40 needed this firepower was for its role as a bomber interceptor. Germany needed a plane which would be able to take on bombers that were attacking deep within the German heartland. The BV-40 was intended to be an alternate direction of design for defensive planes that were being designed at this time. During 1944, Germany was looking into all sorts of different planes such as jet planes like the ME-262 and the Horton 229. It was also looking at rocket planes such as the Backham BA-349 and the ME-163. Rocket and jet planes, even the simpler designs, are expensive and complicated to make. They involve precision engineering and rare metals, both of which Germany was running low on. Manufacturing workshops were under threat of attack as day and night bombing raids destroyed German industrial centres. This resulted in very high competition for designers to secure the limited manufactured jet engines. The BV-40 was a cheaper alternative to jet and rocket planes. It was cheap due to three main factors. Its lack of complexity, so unskilled labour would be able to assemble most of it. Its tiny form, very few resources had to be used to produce one. Its wood design. The airframe was mostly made of wood which could be sourced within Germany. The ideal combat mission was that two BV-40s could be towed by a single BF-109. The BF-109 being a single engine German fighter. After takeoff, the BV-40 would jettison its takeoff dolly. The 109 would tow the gliders to a height above the attacking Allied bomber formation. At height, the BV-40 would detach the tow line and glide freely to the bomber formation. The glider could reach speeds as high as 900 km per hour in a dive. It was thought that the pilot should be able to get two passes on the bomber formation before running out of potential energy and ammunition. The glider would then head back to the landing strip, landing on its fixed skid. Another odd thing about this glider is that the pilot had to lie on his or her belly in a prone position to operate the glider. This photo is of a German prone pilot for another plane. It can't have been nice to fly the plane like that. Flights wouldn't have been too long, so it shouldn't have been too much of a problem. The reason for the prone pilot was to reduce the size of the glider. As well as the advantages we talked about earlier, there are further advantages to making the glider small. One of them is less drag. Due to the small surface area, it allows for two gliders to be towed by one single engine fighter. Another advantage is that the small form makes the glider very hard to hit. Defensive gunners would struggle to hit such a tiny plane. The first test flight was done in May 1944. Blomenvoss received an order for 19 prototypes, with a further order of 200 for production. The program was later dropped with only 7 prototypes that were built. All the prototypes built are currently not accounted for. No one's quite sure what happened to them at the end of the war. Number 4. The Heinkel HE-111Z This plane looks like some sort of bad photoshop. The kind of plane you would see in a thumbnail with some sort of clickbait title. The HE-111Z is exactly what it looks like. It's two HE-111 bombers joined together. 
The Z in the designation stands for Zwilling, meaning twin in German. Each side of the Heinkel 111Z was crewed. The main pilot flew on the left side, along with a mechanic, a defensive gunner, and a radio navigator. The co-pilot flew on the right side, along with another flight engineer and a defensive gunner. 12Z variants were built. The HE-111Z wasn't the only experimental twin fuselage aircraft made by Germany. There was also an experimental twin BF-109 called the BF-109Z. Remember that the Z stands for twin. The prototype was destroyed by an Allied attack and the project abandoned. Other countries also had their own experimental twin fuselage planes. Russia made the DBLK. Only one of those were built. Italy had the SM-92. Only one was built. And America? They had the F-82 twin Mustang. Only 270 were built. The F-82 was built to be a bomber escort. There was a two-man crew, one in each hull. The pilots would take turns during long flights controlling the plane to reduce the fatigue that sets in after flying for long periods of time. And finally, after almost 60 years in 2017, we have the newest twin fuselage plane, the Strato Launch, a plane designed to launch rockets into space from high altitude. Its wingspan broke the last world record and is a staggering 117 meters long. That's almost twice as big as a 747. The Heinkel 111Z was designed not to be a fighter plane or to be a bomber. It was designed to be a tug plane. Side note, it did see some use as a light transport to evacuate wounded troops. But the true purpose of the HE-111Z was to be a tow plane for the ME-321, also known as the Giant due to its size. The ME-321 was a cargo glider, the world's biggest cargo glider. The internal volume of the Giant was similar to a standard German railway car. Its lifting capacity was huge at 23 tonnes. The large internal space and lifting capacity allowed for the transportation of heavy items such as oil, supplies, vehicles, light tanks and artillery pieces. It could even be used to carry 120 fully equipped troops. There are several ways to get an ME-321 into the air. A Ju-90 could be used to tow the ME-321 into the air, but it struggled and wasn't really capable of doing the task. The second way to do it was with a Heinkel 111Z. The third way was to use a trio of BF-110s with tow ropes to tow the ME-321. Up to eight externally attached rocket boosters could be used with the ME-321 to assist with takeoff. The rockets would be jettisoned after the fuel in them was spent. Around 200 ME-321s were built. None of the methods for towing though were really that good. The Ju-90 could barely climb. The Heinkel 111Z wasn't really too much more powerful than the Ju-90 either. The free towing BF-110s was an extremely dangerous setup. One wrong move by any of the pilots towing the aircraft and the glider could end up in disaster, which it did. There was a case of an ME-321 crashing shortly after takeoff. To make matters worse, the flight was configured for carrying troops. Between the four aircraft, there were 129 deaths. Later, the ME-321 was redesigned with six engines and landing gear. This redesign was called the ME-323. The Heinkel HE-111Z was no longer needed now as the cargo glider, now cargo plane, could fly itself under its own power. There was no longer a need to bother with complicated tow aircraft or rocket boosters to assist with takeoff. Only four of the 12 HE-111Zs survived the war. The other eight were destroyed. Seven from strafing runs by Allied aircraft and one was shot down during a towing mission. Sadly, the surviving four had been scrapped. Number three the Fieseler FI-103R Reichenberg. This is a manned V1. The same V1 that was being launched at England from launch sites in northern France. For those of you that don't know what the V1 was, it was the world's first cruise missile. The missile was powered by a pulse jet which would propel the V1 at speeds up to 550 km per hour on the way to its target. It had a basic autopilot which would move the control surfaces in flight to stabilize the missile in a straight line. Around 30,000 V1s were made during the war. Desperate times call for desperate measures, which is where the FI-103R comes in. Unlike the primitive guidance system, a manned missile would be able to hit a target very accurately. The guidance system 
would make the missile land within 10 miles around the designated target. A human would be able to steer the missile straight into an allied ship, even if it was at sea and moving. The FI-103 would be carried under the wing of a heavy German bomber to a point very near the target before being dropped. The pilot would then do their best to steer the 103R onto target. It was suggested that pilots would be able to bail out before impact, but in practice it was near impossible. The pilot's cockpit was very cramped, and adding to the difficulty is that even if the pilot could wedge themselves out, there's a pulse jet right behind them. So unless you could somehow bail out without whacking yourself on the jet engine, you were right out of luck. Oh, and you're also flying at 650 kilometers per hour in a dive whilst this is happening. It was estimated that the chance of surviving a bailout was 1%. Even so, people volunteered to pilot this plane, knowing that flying it would lead to certain death. A training program and testing of the plane begun with 70 students on a program to learn how to fly the plane. There were modified glider variants of the 103R and also two-seater variants for training purposes. The program didn't get off to a good start as there were several accidents causing injury and death during testing of flight characteristics. In time, the program was abandoned as it was decided suicide missions were not part of German warrior tradition. Interestingly, the project was abandoned in favour of the Mistel project. Long story short, you piggyback a smaller plane onto a bigger plane. You fill the big plane full of explosives, the small plane flies the big plane and steers the big plane into a target. The small plane detaches before impact and flies back home. Under 200 FI-103Rs were built, and none of them were ever used against the enemy target. Several of these planes have been preserved in several museums around the world. Before we move on to the next plane on this list, let's take a moment to have a look at the Pacific Theatre of War. Over here we have the Japanese Oka Cherry Blossom, another suicide plane, but this one was actually used in combat. For Oka, appropriately named by the Americans as Baka, meaning idiot in Japanese, the Oka would be carried by a Japanese heavy bomber near to allied ships. When in range, the Oka would detach from the bomber and glide most of the way to the target. Close to impact, the pilot would activate rocket boosters which would propel the Oka to approximately 800 km per hour. At that speed, it would be almost impossible to shoot down with anti-aircraft weapons. The payload was a 1,200 kg explosive. The main disadvantage of the Oka was its limited range. It had a smaller operational range than the 103R. The delivery system of the Oka was its biggest disadvantage. American warships expanded their defensive aircraft screens to account for the range that the Oka could travel. With the skies over Allied ships controlled, the Japanese bombers couldn't get close enough to drop the Oka in range of American ships. 850 Oka were built and many are on display around the world. Number 2. The SAC AS-6 The SAC AS-6, while not a fighter plane, is remarkable enough to earn its place on this list. It was developed as a proof of concept for circular winged aircraft. It resembles a bad photoshop of like a German UFO, the kind that the old History Channel was so fond of before it became the logging and pawn shop channel. The SAC AS-6 is named after its designer, Arthur SAC. His weird circular wing design was first seen when he entered the contest of competing remote control planes with combustion engines. His first model with the circular wing design was the AS-1, which was just over one meter long. Sadly, the AS-1 was unable to take off under its own power. It did, however, achieve 100 meters of stable flight after being thrown into the air by Arthur Sack. The current air minister for Germany who was attending the competition was interested by the circular wing shape and gave Sack funding to continue research into his design. Sack went on to make four more models, each one larger than the first design. The AS-6 was the first design by Arthur intended to be piloted by a human rather than being radio controlled. The first test flight happened in early 1944, during which several flaws were found in the design. One being that the AS-6 was underpowered. A more powerful engine would have been able to give better flight performance. The AS-6 was using a BF-108 engine, which was a design from the early 1930s, and due to wartime shortages, more powerful engines were not available for the prototype. After several more flight tests, the plane was proven to be a failure with its inability to barely get off the runway. There were proposed plans to take the plane to the next stage with the ME-600. 
The proposed ME600 would have enlarged the circular wing considerably. It would also have the latest engine design, complete with fuel injection and a four-bladed propeller. There will also be other features such as improving control surface responsiveness, repositioning the landing gear and redesigning the tail unit. There will also be an addition of a 30mm gun added. The ME600 would have been able to achieve 800km per hour in flight. This plan was never followed through though, and it was nothing more than a basic prototype design. The AS6 was destroyed so it wouldn't fall into allied hands. The wood was broken up into pieces and the miscellaneous metal parts were thrown into an aircraft salvage area. When the Allies arrived at the airfield, the plane was already destroyed and so was not recorded on the inventory of seized items. The AS6 wasn't the first circular wing aircraft invented, nor the last. One of the first circular wing aircraft invented was the Umbrella plane. From its design, it's easy to see why they called it a Umbrella, with its large wing located above the main body of the plane. Another circular wing aircraft that was being produced near the end of World War II by America was the Vought XF-5U, or by its nickname, the Flying Flapjack. Unlike the AS6, the flight characteristics of the Flapjack were actually very good. It was capable of high-speed flight and was able to be armed with quad 20mm cannons and could also carry bombs. The most attractive quality of this plane was its low stall speed, which made it easy to take off and land on the aircraft carrier's deck. The Navy was considering mass-producing this aircraft, but chose not to as they saw the future of aviation was in jet propulsion and not in old-fashioned propellers. Number 1. The Dornier Do-335, also called the Arrow. The Do-335 was one of the fastest piston aircraft of World War II. Its top speed in level flight is said to be around 850 km per hour, although that speed was recorded under perfect conditions. The normal cruise speed was around 750 km per hour. Still though, this is very impressive for a single-seater heavy fighter plane. The key for achieving this kind of speed was by having two engines in one fuselage. One engine was pulling and the other one was pushing. I'll go over the more technical side in a bit. The Arrow was originally designed as a fast bomber, but was redesigned during the emergency fighter program to become a fighter. The first prototype took to the skies in late 1943, with production models being manufactured in early 1944. The armament of the first production variant was two 15mm machine guns with 200 rounds each. There was also a single 30mm cannon with 70 rounds that fired through the propeller hub. If needed, a small internal bomb bay could carry up to 500kg bombs, and there were also external pylons which could be attached further bombs. Surprisingly, for such a large and heavy plane, it was said by the pilots that flew it that it had good handling, maneuverability, a tight turning circle, and good acceleration. It is unusual for a heavy plane to have those characteristics, and when I say this was a heavy plane, I do mean it was heavy. Each engine alone weighed one tonne, producing 1,750 horsepower. Total weight of the Arrow was 7.5 tons, and that isn't with the addition of bombs. Put it like this, it weighed more than a BF-110, or a Bowfighter, but it didn't suffer from the mobility issues that those planes had. The Arrow had a couple more interesting features that made it unique from other fighters at the time. One of these features is that it was the first plane to have an ejector seat. It was more out of necessity than a luxury, due to the situation with the rear propeller. Bailing out normally is a very risky experience. Bailing out when there's a massive spinning propeller probably means you're not going to escape injury. To help further increase the pilot's chance of surviving a bailout, explosive bolts were fitted to the rear propeller and also upper tail fin. Before ejecting, the pilot could detonate these bolts. This would then remove the tail fin and jettison the propeller. Another interesting feature is tricycle landing gear, which was a new concept at the time. Tricycle landing gear is somewhat taken for granted in modern aviation. The reason for the development of tricycle landing gear was so that the rear propeller wouldn't strike the ground during landing and takeoff. Most planes around the period of 1943 were tail draggers, meaning that the tail was resting on the ground. Be kind of difficult to have a propeller at the back of the plane if the tail was meant to be resting on the ground. An additional benefit of the tri landing gear is that the pilot can see forward when taxiing. With a tail dragger, it's a lot more difficult to taxi as the engine is blocking your forward view. All right, we're taxiing this cub out here for takeoff. This is my first time in a tail dragger, so this is pretty exciting, Jack. The other, uh, the other thing I need to tell you too, Steve, I can't see out the window. Yeah, I see that. It's so I have to S-turn the airplane to see ahead. So I put the wheel on the stripe, 
Go back to the right, the wheel and the stripe, and repeat. That way we don't run anybody over. That's right. Okay, now let's visit the technical bit on why this plane was one of the fastest propeller planes of World War II. Its secret was by having two engines in the main body of the plane. By doing this, it was possible to avoid problems that face most classic twin-engine plane designs. Normally, twin-engine planes have increased drag produced by the addition of engines in the wings. The increased drag affects speed and roll rate negatively. Another advantage of having two engines sharing the same thrust line is that if one engine fails, it wouldn't pull the plane to one side. The plane would be flying relatively normal, with the only change being less speed. Both the propellers were set up to spin opposite ways, Standard practice on any twin-engine plane. This is done to counter engine torque. Fighter planes at the time had very powerful engines for how much they weighed. If 100% power was applied at takeoff, an inexperienced pilot may find their plane sharply turning to one side, basically rolling on its axis. The result being that the plane would end up upside down in a ditch and the pilot would be the laughing stock of the airbase. This is due to propeller torque effect. A skilled pilot would slowly increase the power while balancing out the pull to one side by using its control surfaces in the plane. Under high stress situations, such as during aerial combat, a pilot may panic and increase power to maximum and forget to counter the pull. Twin engine planes aren't affected by engine torque because both engines spin in opposite directions, balancing the forces out. It wasn't all rainbows and sparkles with the arrow. This plane didn't come without its faults. One teething problem was that the landing gear wasn't too strong meaning that there was a danger of it collapsing during a landing. Another issue was that visibility out of the cockpit was rather poor. This issue was further not helped by the addition of the massive nose that the plane had. The Arrow was a very expensive plane to operate, with its two very few hungry engines and lots of maintenance needed. All the extra upkeep cost for a plane that was only a bit better than the Fuckerwolf TA-152. The TA-152 was a German late war fighter plane, its speed and performance were only a bit worse than the Arrow. It was also a lot more simple to produce compared to the Arrow. The Arrow did see some use over the skies in Germany, although it's disputed if it ever actually engaged enemy planes or ground targets. One recollection from a French fighter ace was of an Arrow flying at low level. He and his wingmen chose to engage in the Hawker Tempest. They were unable to catch up to the Arrow to enter engagement range. Production of the Arrow was stopped due to complications in manufacturing late in the war. Only 38 were produced. This was a mixture of different variants of the Arrow, some of which were two-seater training aircraft. The two-seater had the nickname Anteater. Another variant was a night fighter. It had a second seat and radar equipment. They only built one of those. Remember those twin fuselage aircraft we were talking about earlier? They wanted to give the Arrow the same treatment. There was a plan to build a twin fuselage version of the Arrow, the Dornier Doe 635, the purpose of which was long range reconnaissance. That variant was never built. Only one Arrow survives today, and it's the A0 variant, currently on display in the National Air and Space Museum near Dulles Airport in the US. Well, there you have it. Those are my top 5 weird German prototypes that actually flew. Feel free to leave a comment on what you think should have been on this list. I'm going to recommend two vids to you. One of which is my top 5 weird Nazi wonder weapon planes that actually flew. That video focuses on late war German jet and rocket planes, all of which actually flew. The other video is top 5 weird Soviet planes that actually flew. That video focuses on weird Russian planes that you most likely wouldn't have heard about before. Anyway, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it.